or by consulting the Hansard's managing editors. Right, we now come to questions. The Secretary of State for Energy and Net Zero, Selene Saxby. Question one, please, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will take questions one and 15 together. Britain is a pioneer of floating offshore wind. While working with the Crown Estate to lease 4.5 gigawatts of seabed capacity for floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea, and we're supporting emerging technologies with a separate funding pot in allocation round six. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The White Cross project in the Celtic Sea has a cable due to come ashore in my constituency and advises me they are unable to agree compensation to businesses disrupted by these works due to a lack of government guidance. Might my right honourable friend meet with me and ideally come and see where the project is due to make landfall to find an alternative cable route and, if not, then ensure that White Cross are in a position to fully compensate the businesses that will be hugely impacted if the planned cable route proceeds? Well, I thank my honourable friend. I know she is a doughty campaigner for floating offshore wind. I am unable to comment on any specific concerns about a particular planning decision, but on the question of compensation, I am sure that the Minister would be happy to meet with her to discuss how Government may be able to provide better guidance in this regard. People whose land is acquired compulsorily should not be left worse off financially, and compensation should be offered in line with the statutory compensation code. What assistance can be had for those fast-growing enterprises, principally reliant on equity? Well, I thank the, uh, my honourable friend for a typically pithy question. In terms uh, of all of our investments which are reliant on equity, we're doing an enormous amount to support the landscape for investment in this country, whether it comes to things like full capital <coughs> expensing or things like the Green Industries Growth Accelerator when it comes to my area. I'm sure the Secretary of State would agree with me that much of Britain's energy needs could be met uh, offshore and be generated offshore. And alongside uh, floating uh, wind power, we also have the opportunity to take advantage of tidal and marine power. I wonder if she recognises Britain as being the second largest, uh, having the second largest uh, tidal range in the world after Canada, and yet we use so little of it. And to put that right, would she agree to meet with me and other colleagues in this House and the Northern Tidal Power Gateway to look at how we can gain uh, green, renewable, secure British energy from Morecambe Bay? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, I uh, thank the right honourable gentleman. I've been following uh, tidal power for many years, and he's right to point out that the UK has a, a strong record both in renewables and also an interesting geological landscape when it comes to new renewable technologies. So we have dedicated £105 million, our biggest ever budget, to flow in emerging technologies through AR6, but I'd be delighted to meet with him to discuss his work further. Shall Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister for her response? Uh, Minister, there is always a, a competition, and I represent Strangford, and the fishing sector is very, very important, Mr Speaker, to me. And, and it's important that we have the uh, floating offshore wind projects, but we also ensure that fishing can be sustainable. So within these discussions, can the Minister confirm that the interest of the fishing industry and representation from the fishing industry is given appropriate weight-taking into consideration uh, the need for sustainable fishing to continue to take place, because without the fishing, then my people lose jobs. Uh, I thank the honourable gentleman. We are a very passionate supporter of the fishing industry. We continue to have conversations with DEFRA to make sure that we can uh, share our marine bed in an equitable way to make sure that we can most get our clean energy needs, but also protect the fishing industry as well. We come to Shannon Minister Dr Alan Whitehead. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm sure the Secretary of State doesn't want a repeat of the failure of allocation round five on her watch where her department managed to crash the offshore wind market. But industry is already warning that the parameters set for floating wind in the next round, AR6, could mean that only one sub-gigawatt project succeeds in getting CFD support way off the target of five gigawatts of floating offshore by 2030 that the government was recently trumpeting. What steps is she taking to ensure that we don't see another failure and lose the global race for this emerging technology. 
Well, I think if people wanted to make sure that we could win the global race for renewable technology, they should frankly vote Conservative, because yeah, 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 yeah. under the Conservatives, we introduced world-leading mechanisms. We, the only people who have built more offshore wind capacity than the UK is China. So we have an enormous track record on this area, which is very successful, and we continue to work with industry to make sure that AL6 will be a success. Dr. Alan Whitehead. Well, I'm not sure that that answer gives much reassurance to industry, indeed gives much reassurance to this House. The truth is, uprating our port infrastructure is critical uh, for deploying uh, floating offshore wind and also for reaching a zero carbon power system. But government support is so inadequate that they are now only funding two ports, dropping viable projects on the way, when according to the Offshore Wind Task Force to reach floating offshore wind ambitions, we need at least the infrastructure in 11 ports uprated. Isn't this another example of the government failing to invest for the future and failing to back British industry? Yeah. Well, I would say that only failure when it comes to renewable energy is the record that Labour left when they were in power, which was 7% of our electricity was generated from renewables when it came to that, but now it's actually 50%. So when it comes to ports, not only have we got our world-leading free port agenda, but we've also put forward, uh, we've also put forward projects like Flomus, which again is helping to build out our port instructs as well. SNP spokesperson Dave Dugan. With uh, 17 gigawatts of floating offshore wind <laughs> planned to be anchored within 100 nautical miles of Aberdeen, what steps will the Secretary of State take to ensure that the uh, technological and engineering uh, know-all know and wherewithal and the supply chain investment is also anchored within 100 miles of the northeast of Scotland? Mm -hmm. Well, I thank him for that question. We are doing an enormous amount of work when it comes to supply chains. Not only have we put forward our £1 billion Green Industries Growth Accelerator Fund, which is to support British supply chains, but also we have taken steps when it comes to making sure we're attracting investment into this country to build uh, British business as well. All of that will be positive for uh, the, the Scottish offshore wind sector. Mary Glynn. Question to you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr uh, Speaker. And I will answer question 2 and 24 together. Um, as previously stated, uh, Mr Speaker, you will know that fuel poverty is devolved. And statistics for England estimate there are 3.17 million households in fuel poverty in 2023, which is over 1.5 million fewer than in 2010. Thank you, Mr Speaker. April's new price cap will see 6 million households across the UK in fuel yes. poverty, and the National Energy Action have estimated that this figure will include 8,800 households in North Tyneside alone. The Government's promised its household upgrade scheme would help 100,000 households, but in nine months it's helped less than 5,000 and only 15 in my constituency. Can the Minister account for the abysmal failure of the flagship policy? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I stand by the record that this Government has in supporting, um, from, a, from a point of view of fuel poverty, uh, thinking about where, how we have helped with affordability, and also, of course, how we have helped with insulation and energy efficient. And we have given unprecedented support to 350,000 households who were kept out of fuel poverty at the energy peak in 2022. In uh, Mr. Speaker, electricity standard charges for people in the North East are 71.2 pence per day, whilst those in the South pay 40.79 pence per day. Can a minister explain why the people in the North East, the area which is experiencing the highest levels of fuel poverty in the country, are paying 75 per cent more than other regions for the privilege of simply being connected to the grid? Thank you. The Honourable uh, Gentleman men, uh, mentions a, re a reasonable point on the standing charges, which is one of the reasons why we have uh, urged Ofgem to do the, um, uh, the uh, import the, uh, to get, find out information on these standing charges. We have had over 30,000 responses to this, and we will be looking at that in due course. Dominic Rob. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, on the ONS and House of Commons data, fuel poverty in England was 13.5% back in 1996. 
It rose to 22% in 2010, and as has already been mentioned, it fell back to 13% in 2023. Does the Minister agree with me that shows Conservatives deliver energy policy with environmental and economic good sense and have done a lot better than the last Labour government? Thank you, Mr Speaker. As I briefly stated, we are incredibly proud of our record, both heading towards net zero, but also the way that we are ensuring that we have energy security, enabling us never to have to go through the cost of living crisis that we have recently gone through. Number three, please, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Network companies are expected to deliver connections by the date stipulated in customer connection agreements. Reforms to accelerate the connection process and build times for transmission infrastructure will help to ensure this expectation is met. Richard Fuller. Mr Speaker, can I welcome the Minister to his new responsibilities and urge him to focus on this particular issue? According to a recent report by UK Sustainable Investment and Finance Association, 44 per cent of investors in solar power says that there are problems getting into connections with the grid. We know there are issues in the distribution network, which means that the transmission network is probably the only place that large-scale utility solar farms can connect. And people are worried that there are any particular parts of that network which will actually accept contracts. So will he look at this in detail? Because there are major concerns in my constituency that there will be connections at Eaton Socom Power Station because that's one of the very few places where, where contracts are being offered. I absolutely understood, and as set out in the spring budget, the government is working with Ofgem and network companies to release more network capacity and to prevent speculative projects from obtaining and retaining network capacity. This, alongside faster network infrastructure delivery, should result in more capacity across the country and help reduce any clustering of generation projects. At Western. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, the national grid infrastructure is critical to the delivery and the connection of these uh, solar farms, as they are for onshore wind and offshore uh, wind. And uh, the importance and urgency of that was stressed by the Windsor Review of August last year. The government has got until 2030 to deliver this. Um, so will the minister update us on the, acceleration, um, uh, sorry, the Transmission Acceleration Action Plan? Um, my honourable, uh, the honourable member is absolutely spot on. We are proud to have gone from 7% renewable energies to 47%. And to go further, we must hit those ambitious targets by unlocking additional investment. For example, through the accelerating strategic transmission investment process, we anticipate unlocking a further £198 billion worth of investment by 2030. Alongside those changes that are already set out, will be key to getting that extra power generated through solar. Rapidly. Um, Surely it's not an adequate justification for building solar farms on 10,000 acres within a six-mile radius around Gainsborough, just because Gainsborough is close to the national grid serving the old power stations. Is this not gross overdevelopment on good arable land, and shouldn't the inspector take account of this overdevelopment? Yeah, yeah. I understand my honourable friend uh, raising this point, and that's why in planning policy and guidance it is clear that solar projects should be directed to previously developed or non-greenfield land. And that was a message that we reinforced in the January National Planning Statement to make sure that we reduce unnecessary clustering. Vera Hobbit. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I also welcome him to his new role. According to the National Grid, £58 billion of investment is needed to meet our 2035 decarbonising target. British electricity demand is expected to rise by 64% in the next 10 years, while the current system is still designed around electricity sources of the past, such as coal. New cables need to be built to bring electricity from renewable energy sources, as we've already heard. What assessment has the Department made of the impact of this problem is having on green investment. Uh, I, th I thank the Honourable Member for her kind words. I enjoyed working with her on many occasions in my former roles. And that is why the government has continued to work with both the public and business to unlock additional investment. For example, through the uh, Connections Action Plan, we would expect an additional 40 gigawatts of additional accelerated connection uh, dates to be released, which will particularly help in the areas of solar. And we are also looking at the £85 billion of investment that we've unlocked since the autumn statement through the Transmission Acceleration Action Plan, all vital components to hit our ambitious targets. Question four. 
Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will take questions 4 and 12 together. As a, as a department and ministerial team meet regularly with industry, industry, for example, through the Hydrogen Investor Forum, the Offshore Wind Industry Council, Solar Task Force, Green Jobs Delivery Group and Cross-Cutting Net Zero Council, which is shortly celebrating its first anniversary. Bill Car makers warned what would happen before the government delayed the end date for the sale of new petrol and diesel cars. Sure enough, sales of new electric cars are down 19% on the latest SMMT figures. Switching to electric driving is cheaper over the lifetime of the vehicle. So why didn't they listen to the warnings from business? Don't they want people to benefit from cheaper travel? Yeah. I, I thank my honourable friend. I proudly drive an electric vehicle myself and I celebrate in the fact that 48,388 electrical vehicles were registered in March 2024 alone. Yes, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Eight in ten of the large energy companies recently surveyed by the UK Sustainable Investment and Finance Association agreed that the UK is falling behind in the race to become the most investable market for low carbon technologies. So what step will the minister take to reassure the clean energy industry that the UK is serious about the transition to net zero, which must include moving away from a commitment to max out oil and gas production? I very much welcome the honourable members uh, highlighting the importance of this area, and I'm sure he will join me in celebrating the fact that we secured £60 billion worth of investment in low carbon technology in 2023, up a staggering 71% on the previous year. We are heading in the right direction to meet our ambitious targets. Yeah. Yeah, Andrew Jenkins. Mr Speaker, does the Minister agree with me that it is economic madness to pursue our current ruthless net zero agenda, outsourcing carbon production to the likes of China and forcing us to pay more to heat our homes and power our economy? We must put the British taxpayer first. I thank uh, my honourable friend for her question. And it is crucial that we work with the public and businesses, not against them. But as we set out in our Powering Up Britain plan to secure our energy system by ensuring a resilient and reliable supply, increasing our energy efficiency, and crucially, as will be welcomed by my honourable friend, bringing down bills. Martin Vickers. Mr Speaker, the uh, Net Zero Humber projects are a, a vital part uh, of the country achieving its uh, Net Zero targets. However, there is concern amongst uh, potential investors, particularly in connection with the carbon cluster projects, that the government is, is moving a little too slowly. Could the uh, Minister give a reassurance to those businesses that uh, the timetable will be honoured? I thank my honourable friend who regularly champions investment in his constituency, working uh, very closely alongside the businesses that he supports. We understand the importance of that. Just before Christmas, we set out a roadmap to speed up this process, and we very much hope this will help unlock this vital investment for his community. Yeah. We now come to Shadow Minister Kerry McCarthy. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome the Minister to his post. I think he's struggling a little bit to get with the programme, but hopefully he will soon be on message. The, I meant in terms of the, the answer that was given to the, the question earlier about um, being anti-net zero. Um, the Department confirmed last month that curtailment payments cost a whopping £1.4 billion last year. That is bill payers' money being used to pay providers to switch off wind power and switch on gas. Why should people be paying even more on their energy bills to switch off cleaner and cheaper energy because this government has failed to deliver the net zero capacity we need? Yeah. Um, okay. well, this is why we have been focusing both on our expanding the interconnectors network so that where we produce energy that we can't use domestically, we can then sell. And also, I very much welcome that last year saw, saw such a large scale uh, expansion of battery farms springing up at an amazing speed that allows us to store this energy that is supplied where it exceeds demand. Garthie. Well, I, I look forward to hearing his predictions as to what the curtailment payments will be in the coming year because they were actually up on the, the previous year. In a survey of energy industry leaders, nearly 90% said we need new policies to make the UK more attractive to investors. 
Nearly two-thirds are moving investment out of the UK, and three-quarters blame a lack of clarity from this government on net zero. Isn't it time for ministers and the backbenchers to drop the culture war and put British industry and British jobs first? Yeah. Well, lack of clarity. I think the uh, shadow ministers mixed that up with the Green Prosperity Plan that even I can't keep up with the latest position uh, between senior yeah. figures in the Labour Party, but I, I think the shadow team very much lost that battle. The reality is last year we secured £60 billion worth of private investment in low carbon technology in 23, which was up a staggering 71% on the previous year, a credit to our team that has delivered that. Aye, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Government recently consulted on the future homes and building standards as explorers how we can drive on-site renewable electricity generation, such as solar panels, in new homes and buildings. In December, we also simplified planning processes for larger rooftop installations by removing the one megawatt cap from non-domestic arrays in permitted development rights. In to the Minister, the CPRE's rooftop solar campaign, which is calling for a far greater emphasis on the installation of solar panels on our nation's rooftops rather than the promotion of ground-mounted solar on greenfield and agricultural land, which harms our natural environment and imperils UK food security. Will he be kind enough to read CPRE's Lighting the Way report, which highlights international best practice on this issue? Well, I thank uh, my honourable friend for uh, that question and for his recommended reading. I was aware of CPRE's uh, rooftop campaign, and I am uh, keen to understand the findings of this latest report that he references. As set out in the British Energy Security Strategy and in the Energy Security Plan, we are aiming for 70 gigawatts of solar capacity by 2035. This would see more than a quadrupling of our current installed capacity, and we need to maximise the deployment of both types of solar to achieve this ambition. Early Sherman. Speaker, it's my first chance to offer my commiserations with the death of your dad. Uh, he was a great man and helped induct me into this place when I first came in in 1979. <laughs> uh, can I ask the uh, Secretary of State this question? And that is, uh, if we are going to have uh, a proper uh, solar rolled out in, ac across the domestic area, we desperately need more trained people in the green sector. Yeah. What's he going to do about that? Isn't it about time that every university, every FE college, offer apprenticeships and ways in to doing these wonderful, wonderful jobs? And will he talk to people leading in the industry, like Octopus, uh, about their shortages of skilled men and women? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, regularly uh, meets with companies such as uh, Octopus, and we are, through our Green Jobs Delivery Plan, expanding and uh, enticing more and more people into uh, the jobs of the future to help deliver our uh, ambitious uh, targets. It is interesting to note, though, that Labour's plans would actually halve the number of apprenticeships going into these jobs in the UK, should they ever get into power. Mr Thomas. Mr Speaker, number six. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2023, there were 80 onshore wind planning applications submitted in Great Britain, a 27% increase from 2022. We have recently changed planning policy in England to pave the way for more onshore wind projects where there is local support. I thank the Minister for that answer. It is now some seven months since the Government claimed to have lifted the onshore wind ban. The Secretary of State at the time claimed that her decision would speed up the delivery of projects. Since then, no new applications for onshore wind farms for domestic use have been submitted. I wonder if the Minister thinks that that has been a success. Yeah. Well, of course, unlike the party opposite, we actually like to work with and listen to communities around the country. And we, as they believe in local consent for projects, it should be up to local communities to decide whether and how much onshore wind they want to see in their area. And they don't like to talk about this, uh, Mr Speaker. But, of course, we have to remember that in 2010, a pitiful 7% of electricity came from renewables, up to 50% under this government. James Gray. Number seven, please, sir. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr Speaker. As with any new development, solar projects may impact communities. The planning system considers all perspectives. When ban balancing local impacts with national need, it is important that local areas benefit from hosting net zero infrastructure. Many developers already offer a community benefit package. James Gray. Mr Speaker, if the Minister wanted to see the impact that a massive solar farm like the so-called Lime Down Carbuncle in my own constituency will have on local, local people, he should come to Marlesbury Town Hall last week, where we had 750 people protesting against this appalling uh, plan in North Wiltshire. It's going to be 2,000 acres of, of, of panels, 3 million panels altogether, 5,000 acres going to be blighted by it, 30 miles to the nearest connection down at Melksham. Mr Speaker, this is an absolute disgraceful proposal. 
It, it comes a time when Wiltshire has eight out of ten largest solar farms anyhow. We already have enough vastly exceeding our, our, our county target for solar production. So will the Minister consider the question of cumulative effect of all of these yeah. solar farms? Will he ask the, the National Infrastructure Board to take cumulative effect of solar farms into account when considering an application yeah, such as yeah. this one? Yeah. Well, I very much thank my honourable friend uh, for that question, and uh, he raises a very interesting uh, 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 topic, and uh, one, of course, that we are listening uh, to. The project that he speaks to is, of course, at the pre-application stage, with an application expected to be submitted to the planning inspectorate between January and March 25. And, of course, due to my quasi-judicial role in determining planning applications for development consent, it is not appropriate to comment on any specific matters. I am aware that there are constituents uh, of his coming to Parliament this Thursday, and I would be happy to meet with them to discuss their concerns. Steve Double. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The government offers grants of 7,500 to those wanting to install a heat pump, or 5,000 pounds to install a biomass boiler under the boiler upgrade scheme. And support for energy efficient upgrades and low carbon heat is also available through our Help to Heat schemes. Steve Double. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Cornwall has a very large number of properties that are off. The grid. One of the ways that they can decarbonise their heating is through the use of renewable liquid heating fuels. Uh, last year, the government said that there would be a consultation on uh, promoting and supporting the use of this fuel uh, in the coming months. However, in response to a recent written question, it was suggested that this would not be uh, launched until at least September this year. So, could I ask the Minister if the government would bring forward this consultation as soon as possible so that we can help people decarbonise through the use of renewable fuels? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Government recognises the potential for renewable liquid fuels to play a role in decarbonising heat and where heat pumps are unsuitable and is working to place a, a pace to develop a consultation that will explore this role in more detail. And we will be issuing a consultation in September in line with commitments made by Ministers during parliamentary uh, uh, debates on the Energy Act. And I support the cause of the uh, Honourable Member for Sidostal and New Key. The Transition to HVO oil is far cheaper uh, than heat pumps. Uh, we're talking about a conversion of around £500. It can be done in an hour, and I would urge the government to proceed with haste with this. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, it is important to note that we are taking this matter incredibly seriously, and we're also providing funding to tackle fuel for poverty with this and reduce carbon emissions through the energy company obligation, the Home Upgrade Grant and the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund. No, not me. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The historic nuclear roadmap that I announced in January reconfirmed the government's ambition to deploy up to 24 gigawatts of nuclear power by 2050. This roadmap sets out plans to make investment decisions concerning three to seven gigawatts every five years between 2030 and 2040. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, nuclear is essential not just for our economy but also for our national security. And truly, sovereign supply doesn't just mean commissioning new reactors; it means increasing our skills base. So, I welcome the £750 million invested in this. Can I ask my honourable friend what steps his department is taking to ensure that people in communities like Haywood and Middleton can access this uh, skills funding so that they can take advantage of high-skilled, well-paid jobs in the sector? My honourable friend is absolutely right, and I can indeed. He is a doughty champion in this area. Indeed, he should be, with Atom Valley in his very constituency. And so last month, when the Prime Minister announced significant investment, as he references, in developing the nuclear skills pipeline, helping the sector to fill 40,000 new jobs by the end of the decade, including supporting plans to double the number of nuclear apprentices and quadruple the number of specialist science and nuclear fission PhDs. Stephen Trapp. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And with your permission, I will take question 10 and 22 together. The UK has already made tremendous progress in securing investment into green technologies. Recent figures indicate that the UK saw £60 billion of investment in 2023, meaning that since 2010 the UK has seen £300 billion of public and private investment into low-carbon sectors. As a department, the ministerial team and I meet regularly with investors, such as through our second Hydrogen Investment Forum event and regular roundtables, to understand how we can better encourage investment. Very much, and I'm grateful to the Minister for that answer. It is absolutely true that the UK has a remarkable track record in winning investment in green technology, but with other countries moving ahead at pace now with their own green investment plans, does my honourable friend agree with me that if we can show that we've got effective policies for speeding up planning consents for energy projects, for expanding grid capacity at a 
far faster rate than what we've been doing. And if we can fix our contracts for difference regime, then we can demonstrate to investors once again that we are the very best place to invest in green technology. Uh, my uh, right honourable friend is absolutely right. We have a proud record uh, on investment into green uh, and clean technologies in this country, and indeed, in many ways, we are leading the world. Uh, we have launched, obviously, just uh, last year, our Giga project. We are launching uh, Auction Round 6 for the CFD, which is the standout leader when it comes to introducing and enticing investment in these technologies in the country. But of course, we can go faster and, fa uh, uh, and further, and where we can, we will. And that's why I'm very pleased to see the work that's going on within my department and indeed with industry to do just that. Alexander Stafford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There's no more important uh, industry or technology for the green industries in the UK than hydrogen. So I was very pleased to see that after much dilly dallying, the department has listened to my continued advocacy for hydrogen <coughs> blending in pipes. And I look forward to seeing those plans coming forth uh, imminently. But what support is the department providing to home appliance providers who want to take advantage of the benefits of hydrogen to create hydrogen ready technology which can be used to both blend blenders and fully hydrogen appliances? Well, once again, another doughty champion uh, for one of the expanding sectors uh, that we are investing in uh, in the UK. My uh, honourable friend's championing of the hydrogen industry in this country is unmatched. And indeed, I'd be happy to meet with him to discuss with uh, him how we can further progress and indeed uh, speed up investment into hydrogen, which will be key to securing so many of our ambitious projects moving forward. And McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As co-chair, along with my friend, the honourable member for Paisley and Renfrewshire, north of the APPG on Green Deal mis-selling. We are still waiting for justice after nearly 10 years for those of our constituents who were told to invest in green technologies for their homes. Now, there is a, a legal process going on at the moment, but it is very lengthy. And Given that most of our constituents were over the age of 70, some over the age of 80, when this all happened, um, there is a political solution to this. Multiple Prime Ministers, multiple Secretaries of State have agreed that what happened to our constituents was dreadful. Why not give a political solution? And that will encourage other people to feel confident that they too can invest in green technologies, knowing that the government has got their back if it should go wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I agree with the hon. Lady. It was dreadful uh, what happened. Obviously, there is an ongoing legal process, so I am restricted in what I can say at this dispatch box. But I would be very happy to meet with her to discuss the specifics of her constituents that were affected by this in the coming days. Very tough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the South West is proud to punch above its weight in green technology and will soon welcome a £4 billion gigafactory at the Gravity site near Bridgewater, creating 4,000 new jobs and boosting the green economy. Investment uh, in infrastructure around the country is needed to see more developments such as this. So, what steps is the Department planning to help facilitate ventures such as this? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's fantastic to hear Lib Dems championing Conservative policies which are bringing investment and new jobs uh, into the country. That's what happens under a Conservative uh, government. And of course, it's great to see the Giga Factory that's planned uh, for the South West of England. But indeed, through Giga and through so many of the other projects and funds that we have launched as a department, we expect to see many more of these projects coming through. But of course, there's work to be done. We can go further and faster. And as I said, we are where we can, we will. And I look forward to working with her to further champion the UK as the destination of choice for all those who want to invest in these new technologies. Louis French. Question 11, please, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, with your permission, I uh, will take question 11 and 23 together. Our plans to decarbonise the grid by 2035 are ambitious but achievable and assessed by the Climate Change Committee to be realistic, and it will build on the UK's achievement of becoming the first major economy to have halved emissions. A net zero grid by 2030 would cost taxpayers £116 billion, according to independent analysis, and would mean a made in China transition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. French. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Conservatives have a strong track record in promoting renewables, and this government is supporting British companies and supply chains through programmes such as Giga, which now stands at over £1 billion. Does my right honourable friend agree that Labour's unaffordable and unrealistic plans to achieve a net zero grid by 2030 will not give British supply chains time to grow and that would mean a tra transition made in China? I completely agree with my honourable friend. We have just seen a situation in Europe where countries have had to wean themselves of Russian oil and gas. We cannot do that only to become dependent on other parts of the world for our energy needs. Our plan will give British supply chains time to develop, making sure that British workers can reap the benefits of the energy transition. But according to expert analysis, the Labour plans will cost taxpayers £100 billion, all to undermine British manufacturing and risk blackouts. 
Linton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the Secretary of State is aware, the Environmental Audit Committee inquiry into decarbonising the economy has heard evidence that no newly commissioned nuclear capacity, even small modular reactors, is able to come on stream until 2035. New energy projects given planning consent today are unlikely to connect to the grid before 2030, and the scale of necessary grid network rollout to reach our own 2035 target is already huge. So what does my right hon. Friend make of the feasibility, let alone the cost that she's highlighted today, of the fantasy pipe dream of official Labour Party yeah, policy yeah, to yeah, decarbonise yeah. by 2030? Well, I thank my right hon. Friend for the question. The plans that we have set out are the largest expansion of nuclear in 70 years, radical reforms to the grid. However, it does take time to build things. Labour's 2030 policy is mad, it's bad, it's downright dangerous. I am yet to meet a serious expert or a single person in industry who believes it's possible. We have a record to be proud of becoming the first major economy to halve our emissions, but the yeah, Labour yeah. plans would heap costs onto taxpayers in stark contrast to our pragmatic and proportionate approach. If grid decarbonisation by 2030 really did cost the billions the Secretary of State claims, she might care to explain why her own policy is to achieve 95% of full decarbonisation by the very same date. She knows that independent analysis actually says that Labour's plan would reduce families' energy bills by £300 a year. So will she fess up? Will she admit that the true price of her failure will be paid for by hard-pressed families in their energy bills? I would completely reject that. And this is from many conversations that I've had with industry and with experts. If you look at the plans that we've set out, they've been assessed by the CCC as being realistic. The plans that the Labour Party have set out have been criticised by pretty much Every Everybody. single part Everybody. of the energy system. And I think the Honourable Gentleman, rather than playing politics with this issue, should consider, consider the reality of the taxes, the raised bills, and the problems with the economy that their plans would force on Britain. Olivia Blake. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last year, the government promised they would publish their decarbonisation plan by the end of 2023, but they have failed to do so. Isn't that because she's too embarrassed to admit the truth? She's way off track, even from a 2035 clean power, um, because she's bungled the offshore wind auction, is failing on energy efficiency and refuses to end the onshore wind ban. Isn't it the case that she wants to attack Labour's plan because she can't defend her own? Uh, I thank the Honourable Lady, but really that is an extraordinary question. And really there would be much more credibility from the party opposite if they would actually recognise that the UK is the first country in the G20 of the top 20 largest economies to halve emissions. So whilst again they might play politics with this, I am absolutely happy to defend our position of dealing with our climate change obligations in a pragmatic way that protects household finances. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question 13, please. Properly regulated markets, which incentivise private capital to invest in the energy system, provide the best outcome for consumers and promote market competition as the best driver of efficiency, innovation, and value. How do you work? Well, despite the Minister's disagreement, public ownership exists in our energy system. For example, 45% of our offshore wind assets are publicly owned, just not by the UK. They belong to the state-owned companies of countries like Denmark and Norway. Publicly owned energy companies can accelerate the transition to clean energy while creating jobs, reducing bills and ensuring that the public benefits directly from our common resources. Countries that are leading the transition to renewables have realised this. When will the Minister? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. I, I thank the Honourable Member. I mean, it's flattering. I'm in, what, 48 hours into my role, and she would like to upgrade my role so that I could personally be in charge of uh, delivering energy companies. But I would gently remind her, in her own local uh, authority, Nottingham uh, City Council, with their ah, Robin Hood energy, ah, ah. Uh, chaired by a politician, for which the public want probably few of us, not more of us, uh, managed to cost the taxpayers a staggering £38 million. Pounds. Question number 15, Mr Speaker. 
Uh, NSTA analysis shows that domestically producing natural gas is almost four times cleaner than importing liquefied natural gas from abroad. Yep. Without continuing licensing, our dependence on imported oil and gas, including LNG, will only increase more quickly in the future. Yep. Tom Hunt. Mr Speaker, I've always been a fan of us exploiting fully our natural resources. We've got to take a pragmatic route to cutting our carbon emissions, but also at the forefront of our thinking is to drive down energy costs, boost energy security, and not do anything that enfeebles our country on the global stage. Um, does the Minister agree with me that not only is this the right approach in terms of energy, energy costs, but actually by not importing as much liquefied natural gas, it, 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 it makes our carbon footprint smaller as well? Mr Speaker, I, I completely agree with my honourable friend's analysis. Utilising our own domestic resources is just common sense when the alternative is to import more fuels from abroad. It would be an act of self-sabotage to put restrictions on our own domestic sector, damaging jobs and investments, only to liquefy and ship gas from halfway around the world yep. and creating more emissions in the process. Yeah. Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I welcome the Minister to his post, but he will know that most of our gas imports are not LNG, they actually come from Norway via pipeline where gas production is half as polluting as it is in the UK. New oil and gas will not only be disastrous for our climate but will also fail to boost energy security. So following the welcome announcement that the UK will finally withdraw from the Energy Charter Treaty, will the government also reverse its decision to license the Rosebank oil field which will cost the climate and the public purse extremely dear? I thank the Honourable Member for her kind comments and whilst we scale up our clean energy uh, success such as renewables which we've seen go from 7% to 40% there is still a need for oil and gas and a failure to issue new licence would make no difference to the consumption of oil and gas but will increase imports which are typically with higher emissions and would damage our economy. Dr Dan Poulter. Number 16 Mr Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Offshore transmission is central to the government's balanced approach to delivering an electricity network fit for net zero. Dr. Dan Poulter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, my, the Minister will be aware of the Norwich to Tilbury uh, pylon proposals, which, cut, uh, which put 50 metre pylons through swathes of uh, Norfolk, Suffolk, and Essex countryside. He will also be aware that the ESO review that was recently carried out indicated that very soon it would be cost neutral to have an offshore option for that energy, that same energy transmission, and that multiple um, points for connecting uh, offshore, offshore wind turbines uh, to the grid um, also have multiple planning problems. Um, so will my honourable friend um, do what he can to engage with National Grid and get them to do the right thing and look at the cost neutral option of offshore transmission rather than an onshore proposal that there currently is in place? I thank my honourable friend, whose uh, long-standing record of making uh, powerful uh, suggestions on behalf of his constituents and neighbouring constituencies on this important issue. The ESO's recent study considered a total of nine alternative options for transmission routes in East Anglia, and this included three predominantly offshore options and two hybrid onshore and offshore options. It is important we try to work with communities. We now come to Topitals, Greg Smith. Number one, sir. Mr Speaker, uh, I would first like to pay tribute to the Right Honourable Member for Beverley and Holderness, who has served this Government for eight years, including yeah, 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 as Minister yeah, yeah. for Energy Security and Net Zero since 2022. He will be missed in the role for his expertise. He attended his first COP in 2005 and was instrumental in our achievements at COP28 last year. He has helped the UK halve its emissions, an extraordinary achievement, the first major economy to do so, and his work founding the Net Zero Council, protecting families through the global energy crisis and backing 200,000 British oil and gas workers, leave him a legacy of which he can be very proud. I would also like to welcome my honourable friend, the member for Swindon North, a tireless campaigner who I will know will continue this government's world-leading work. Since I last updated this House, families will be benefiting from a drop in the energy price cap worth almost £250 a year to the average household. I have set out plans to reform tariffs, saving bill payers up to £900 a year, and invested £750 million in nuclear skills as part of my plans for the largest expansion of nuclear in 70 years. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The consultation on renewable liquid fuels from September is welcome, but a recent survey by the Future Ready Fuel campaign showed that 88 per cent of respondents from off-grid households actively want the option of switching to a renewable liquid fuel. So can my rightable friend work with me to ensure that we can get consumers the choices they actually want, not the heat pumps that many don't? 
Uh, I thank my honourable friend. I know he's a fantastic champion for people living off the gas grid. We are supporting off-grid homes to transition to heat pumps or biomass boilers through the boiler upgrade scheme with grants of up to £7,500. Renewable fuels like HVO have the potential to play an important role in heating off-grid buildings and will be issuing a consultation on that role by September this year in line with commitments made by ministers uh, during the Energy Act. We now come to show Secretary State of Melbourne. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I start by paying tribute to your father, Doug? He was a remarkable fighter for social justice, and, Mr. Speaker, we share your sense of loss. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, a year ago, after presiding over the absolute scandal of the forced installation of prepayment meters, her predecessor promised full compensation for anyone affected. Unbelievably, she has left it to the energy companies to decide who gets compensation and how much. They've assessed 150,000 people, and just 1,500 got anything. 99% got nothing. Why has she so catastrophically failed to deliver justice for those affected by the PPM scandal? Well, my right honourable friend does actually raise an important issue, and the question of prepayment meters is something that we have gripped since the first scandal emerged. Not only have we made it clear that the horrors that we saw last winter of people forcing prepayment meters on vulnerable households should not take place, but I've also been in contact with Ofgem in recent days about making sure that people can get the compensation they deserve at the speed in which they need it. Mr Speaker, that is simply not good enough. It's a year on. She's the Energy Secretary. She should be delivering that compensation to people, and she's failing across the board. The onshore wind ban remains. The offshore wind market crashes. The insulation schemes are a disaster, while she spends her time appeasing the Flat Earth Anti-Net Zero Brigade in her own party. No wonder the Energy Minister resigned. Isn't the truth? She's failing in her job, and the British people are paying the price. Well, the right honourable gentleman did not listen to my previous answer in that it was this government which worked with Ofgem to make sure that forced prepayment meters stopped taking place for vulnerable households. That's something that we have said very clearly is abhorrent and we don't want to see it again. In terms of compensation, we're working with Ofgem. But if he talks about the wider energy plans, and we should do that, I think he should consider the recent comments from industry which have said that Labour's plans would leave the country uninvestable, but that they would hike the amount of bills that people would pay, that they would generate so much in terms of needed taxes, over a hundred billions of costs for their mad plans to decarbonise the grid by 2030, which, let me be clear, are not backed by industry or the unions or consumers. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We've seen the price of fuel go up at the pumps because of what's happened in Ukraine. But in this country, we've also seen there's a great variety at different petrol stations. I'm really pleased the CMA have looked into it and the government is coming forward with Price Watch. We've seen something similar in Australia, which saves up to £50 for the individual. But can we make sure that the government, when this comes into play, has an advertising campaign so the public know that they will be able to see prices up to date every 30 minutes locally for the best place to get their fuel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, we will publish the Government's response to the recent Pump Watch consultation as soon as possible. And we continue to work closely with the Competition and Markets Authority and the sector technology companies to launch Pump Watch this year. And of course, the Honourable Member makes an incredibly important point that when we launch this, we will, of course, be making sure that everybody knows about this valuable resource. Dave Dugan, SNP spokesperson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We learned last year that no fewer than 200 Department for Energy, Security and Net Zero jobs were going to transfer from London to Aberdeen. This was championed by no, one, no fewer than the, the Secretary of State for Scotland and the Minister for Nuclear and Renewables. It now transpires that only 35 jobs will transfer to Aberdeen. For context, Mr Speaker, that's 0.37 per cent of the Desnes workforce. So is the Secretary of State content for that derisory transfer of jobs from her department to Aberdeen? And presumably she won't be, so what is she going to do about it to give the North East of Scotland a better deal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I thank the honourable gentleman for uh, raising this issue. We're very proud. I'm particularly proud that we've announced Aberdeen as our second uh, headquarters. Uh, hosting our second headquarters underlines the importance of the North East of Scotland or net zero transition. Unlike the Scottish National Party, we do champion the North East of Scotland, anti exploration, anti new licences, and anti uh, oil and gas. The headquarters already has over 100 staff. And more than 135 by March 2027 is our ambitious. We've been doing some, I've been doing some research, though. It turns out that the Scottish government, his party's government, uh, have a, a grand total of zero jobs in his own constituency in Angus. Simon Chubb. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, residents in Cranbrook and Tithe Barn have faced frequent energy outages and, let me just make it really clear, woeful customer service from Eon's district heating networks. Now, the Government's Energy Act means district heating networks will finally be properly regulated. Could my right honourable friend outline when this regulation will be brought in? Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. The initial phase of the heat uh, network regulation, including transparency rule, rules, will come into force in 2025. Some requirements such as pricing regulation and guaranteed standards of performance require more market data and will be introduced in the second phase regulation in 2026. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Minister acknowledge that the alarming delays in Track 1 carbon capture and storage expansion and Track 2 timelines endangers the Humber's status as a global leader in hydrogen and CCS, also endangers £15 billion of private investment and jeopardises industrial decarbonation and economic growth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We recognise the role that CCUS can play for the economy, not just in the Humber, but the wider British economy, which is why we set out £20 billion of investment to commit to this particular sector. We set out an ambitious roadmap just before Christmas, and we continue to meet with investors to see how we can speed up the process. Andrew Rosenthal. Mr Speaker, sir, I have been speaking to my constituents about the whole agenda of net zero. And whilst the people of Romford are very determined to see cleaner and greener energy sources, I have to say the priority, I think, for my constituents is energy security, energy self-sufficiency and energy sovereignty. I'm worried that we're not taking the people with us on this issue because a lot of people simply cannot afford this extreme agenda, which actually could finish up giving China a competitive advantage and bankrupting our own country. Sorry. Just, just, just to remind people that it's topicals. I've got to get through because you missed out on the previous one. Doesn't mean say you can extend your question. Please, I've got to get everybody in. Let's help each other, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My honourable friend highlights the importance of working with the public and business. Whilst the Shadow Secretary of State wishes to sneer at those who are sceptical, we have to win hearts and minds. And that's why my honourable friend will welcome our Powering Up Britain plan to secure our energy system by ensuring a resilient and reliable supply, increasing our energy efficiency, and crucially bringing down bills. I came spring. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Secretary of State explain? Did the Energy Minister leave because he was worried about losing his seat to Labour at the next election? Or was it because he could no longer bear to support the woeful energy policy of this government? Yeah. Which one was it? I mean, I, I would direct the Honourable Gentleman to his letter. And I would reiterate, by the way, our pride in the work uh, of the Minister and the amazing contribution that he's made to this government and this country. Uh, Clayton Lee Moores in my constituency is home to the Lancashire Centre for Alternative Technologies, initiated by the Government's Get Building Fund. Will the Minister agree to a visit here to see how they are providing financial and R&D support to accelerate the commercialisation of low carbon technologies? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree. It's incredibly encouraging and exciting to see the developments, and I would, of course, be delighted to visit my honourable friend in her constituency at any time. Lee Anderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This whole net zero session this morning has proved once again to me uh, how out of touch this place is with the rest of the country. The poorest 40% of UK households will be made much worse off with net zero policies. This is according to a report from York University. The poor in Asheville will get poorer and rich eco-fanatics like Dale Vince will get richer and pass on some of his millions to that lot there and just stop oil. So as a minister, can the minister confirm to me, to the nearest trillion pounds, how much net zero will cost? 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable gentleman for his question. Let me be clear: I am very proud of what this government has done to protect the poorest in society from rising bills, which, by the way, were as a result of international factors and a volatile uh, gas market. But let me be absolutely clear: the only way that Dale Vince, his climate extremists, and his enablers will come anywhere close to having influence on energy policy is by electing a Labour government, which, frankly, is the only thing voting reform is going to achieve. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Speaker, on Friday in my constituency surgery, I met with representatives of the Ridding Lane uh, Solar Action Group who are concerned about the proposals to build a new solar farm uh, covering 145 football fields worth of land between the villages of Gleaston, Dendron, Lease and New Biggin. Would my uh, friend the Minister agree with me that solar farms are great, but they should not go on prime agricultural land? Well, I thank my honourable friend for the question. Of course, as he is aware, we already has a, have a presumption against building on the best and most versatile agricultural land. Due to my quasi-judicial role in planning, obviously I can't uh, speak to the issue directly, but I'd be very happy to meet him and indeed any representatives from his constituency to discuss the project in question. Ellen Morgan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've been contacted by a popular village pub that's struggling with its uh, energy debt and astronomical energy bill. These pubs are at the heart of our local communities and they are closing at an alarming rate, would the Secretary of State consider measures to enable them to manage their historic debt by allowing them to pay it off more slowly or supporting them in some other way so that we can keep these important pubs open? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I couldn't agree more that uh, the, these pubs are at the heart of our community. And that's one of the reasons why I have regular meetings with UK hospitality and also think about how we can look at these bills, including things like blend and extend. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On Honest Morn, companies like Mona Lifting and Clangevney, supported by the Green Digital Academy, which has been funded by £2.7 million from the Community Renewal Fund, are working hard to use their businesses to help deliver net zero with the installation of solar panels and charging points. Does the Minister agree with me that it is thanks to this UK Government and innovative, forward-thinking companies like Mona Lifting that are leading the way that we will deliver net zero? My honourable friend once again championing her constituency, working with visit businesses so that in conjunction we can drive up our renewables. And it's uh, in thanks to the government that we changed the planning rules to make it easier for large scale solar rooftop installations. And I also welcome households playing their part with 17,000 solar panel uh, installations per month last year. Ruth Thank you and big hugs, Mr. Speaker. My constituent uh, for your father. My constituent, Jo Steen, did the right thing, switched the family car to electric, but now the cost and lack of points are pushing him into fuel poverty. What are they doing to encourage options for charging for people who don't live in detached homes? And is it true that the new minister voted against the zero, vehicle, the zero um, car emission vehicle mandate? I thank the honourable member. It's an important point, and I, as a proud electric car driver, had concerns that not all people had equal access to charging that I did with my own driveway at the house. And therefore, I was thrilled when the government managed to deliver a 50% increase in EV charging points last year alone. Dr. Neil Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Energy security is national security, and food security is national security. And up and down the country, there are plenty of rooftops, residential, industrial, and agricultural that are suitable for solar panels. Can my honourable friend reassure the country that we will prioritise these sites for our solar footprint rather than jeopardising prime food producing land or indeed our precious green belt? I thank my honourable friend for the question. He's absolutely right. Food security and, and energy security are both vitally important. That's why the UK Solar Task Force identified the need to address barriers relating to rooftop solar deployment, including access to finance as a priority. The rooftop subgroup was established to focus specifically on this area, and we are exploring options to facilitate low-cost finance from retail lenders to help households and businesses with the, up cost, with the upfront cost of solar installation on rooftops. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Smart meters are vital in helping families cut uh, bills and save money on their energy. Yet the government's own figures show that four million smart meters are faulty. Isn't this another catastrophic failure? And when is the Secretary of State going to get a grip on this issue? Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And clearly, this is a, a, an issue that concerns us here in government, and that is why we are making sure that we are striving to do everything that we can to make sure that we are solving this issue. Jeremy Stern. Mr. Speaker, the giant pylons, the absolutely huge pylons associated with the transmission route, are causing grave concern in the Highlands. Can I have an assurance that very strong consideration will be given to undergrounding these cables near the communities affected and indeed going under the ocean where we can? 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And whilst the Shadow Minister heckles to say yet another NIMBY, we actually recognise that uh, we want to work with communities and respect their local knowledge to inform present and future works. All transmission projects are required to progress through the robust planning process, which includes statutory consultations and of individual planning reviews. And I'm sure the honourable member will feed directly into that. Lord Russell Boyle. Forty per cent of properties in this country don't even have an EPC, and those that do in the private rented sector and in the private ownership sector, only thirty per cent are EPCC. Last year we made only one per cent improvement on this. EPCC is the standard. So when does the Minister expect that we will ever get to 100% EPCC in our housing stock? And what are they doing to increase the speed of process? Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. S- Mr. Speaker. Um, the pace of delivery of the G- GBIS is accelerating quickly as well, and with the rate of delivery doubling over the past three months. We have a record of proud on energy efficiency. We inherited in 2010, where only 14 per cent of homes were well insulated, and now we have that figure up to nearly 50 per cent. That completes questions. We will let the front benches clear.